Most of us at some point have found ourselves at the crossroads between adolescence and adulthood, where we're uncertain about next steps. Should I study this degree? Should I take this job? Should I be with this person? For some people, the answer, in the short term at least, is to drop everything and put as much distance between themselves and their impending decisions as possible. Stephen Gibbs is one person who made the decision to up sticks and leave for a new country whilst he figured out his master plan. But Stephen never returned. So what do you do when your loved one goes to find themselves and never comes back? The very last words he said were, I'll see you at Christmas, if not before. I'm Pandora Sykes, and you're listening to The Missing, an Amazon Music-exclusive podcast series brought to you with the help of the charities Missing People and Locate International. They believe that all of the cases in this series could still be solved. This is The Missing, Stephen Gibbs. Stephen's parents, Vera and Richard, met whilst working in the same hotel in Piccadilly. A year and a half later, they were married, and Stephen, their first child, was born on the 18th of June, 1954. We continued to live with Richard's parents for about a year, and then we were very fortunate in obtaining a top floor flat in Clapham, where we moved. That's Vera, Stephen's mum. Two guineas a week for a flat, can you believe that? Within two years, Roger, their second, had arrived. The very moment that Roger was born, Stephen could not wait for Roger to be old enough to be a playmate. And so, you know, it got to the stage where um, Stephen would then be able to help undo the cot in the morning and help Roger to get out of the cot so that they could both start playing together. And that was from a very, very early age. And they were great mates. The family eventually relocated to Chessington, 10 miles away. Richard had been working as a steward for British Airways. But soon after the move, he began a new job as a Hoover repairman. We bought a big old Victorian house, and so it was a much nicer house to live in for a family. But it wasn't so good living in a busy town. But the kids settled very well. When we were in Chessington, Steve and I spent many um, occasions out playing together in the streets, because you could in those days. That's Roger, Stephen's brother. What I remember mostly about Chessington is going to a place we used to call the Dip, where there was a stream and we used to go up the sewer pipe and play there and uh, we crawled right along this pipe until we came to a big open space where presumably all the water poured into the stream. I don't know. I mean, we weren't in any danger, or we could have been, but we weren't at that time. So, yeah, we were just being boys, having fun, scraping our knees and... uh, getting our clothes dirty, I'm sure, like kids do. The Gibbs then moved to Hounslow. One of the main things about Hounslow is the, uh, it's being very close to Heathrow Airport. And so one of the real main memories of living there was the aeroplanes constantly flying by and us having to either stop our conversations or shout. Uh, And also the, the part, the aeroplanes passing by would interfere with the television signal. So we'd obviously get crackling on the TV screen. The family eventually welcomed two new children, Tracy and Stuart. Vera looks back on those days fondly. I had four crazy kids. They were always doing such silly things and saying such silly things. And I do remember it as a time of laughter, a lot of laughter. As the children grew up, their personalities began to emerge. Roger was the athletic one, while Stephen was more studious and a relentlessly hard worker. Vera remembers his first job, a milk round for the local dairy when he was 14, which he took very seriously. 
He was so popular with the owner of the dairy. She absolutely adored Stephen because he worked so hard. He was always studying. I mean, I, I'm sure he went out with his friends as well, but he seemed to be always studying for his A-levels. By the time Stephen finished school, he was sporting a long head of hair and a taste in music to match. He was a bit of a hippie. He wasn't a, a hippie hippie. And I know he liked his, his music, which was more up to the, to the heavy side of, of music, like Jimi Hendrix and Genesis. The family have precious few photos of Stephen from that time. But it wasn't for lack of trying. He was a bit shy about having his photograph taken. And I remember just in one photograph in particular, he just turns his back to the camera. So all we get in the picture is the back of his head. I don't know if he was actually shy or if it was just a game he played where he didn't seem to want to be in the photographs. Stephen went on to study computer science at Essex University. He was very sensitive. I think that's why I worried about him when he first went off to university. There were periods in his life when he was a little introverted, but mostly he was this crazy person that was making everyone laugh all the time. He seemed to settle in very quickly. Life seemed to be a round of get-togethers and parties when he first went to um, university. Whilst he enjoyed his newfound freedom, his family were always his number one priority. One thing about Stephen, he still came home for all the family birthdays. He also never missed an opportunity to write home. He wrote lots of letters, very silly letters that uh, didn't really tell us much about what he was up to. We were all very much into Monty Python in those days. So if you read any of his letters, you'd see the connection between his silly sense of humour and the Monty Python sense of humour. By the time Stephen started uni, Vera had returned to full-time work, taking a job as a civil servant with the Ministry of Defence. In between semesters, Stephen would return home and work to help support his family financially. He worked as a postman. He also worked for Firestones in their factory. And I remember the people at Firestones told him to calm down and not work so quickly because their quota would get raised. Upon completion of his degree, Stephen was left with the same doubts about his future that many 20-year-olds wrestle with after leaving uni. He had a couple of weeks at home thinking about what he was going to do. And then because he had decided that he didn't want to just sit in front of a computer writing programmes all day, he was thinking maybe he would teach computer science. But he wanted to get away, do a mundane job and have the summer to think about his future career. He actually got a job in a hotel in Cornwall, not far from Land's End, so it was as far away as he could possibly get. Stephen spent the summer there, where he continued to send weekly letters home. I was 40 that summer, and he remembered my birthday and bought me some lovely china and sent it through the post. Unfortunately, he didn't have it back properly, and it was nearly all smashed by the time it got to my address. But it was just the fact that he kept in touch Stephen returned from Cornwall at the end of September 1975. His family, who had been on holiday in Spain, arrived home only to find out that they wouldn't have much time to reconnect. Stephen was only home for one whole day after we arrived home from holiday from Spain. Then he told us that he'd made plans uh, to go to France for the grape picking season. Picking season, or Les Vendanges, was a three-month period, typically beginning in August and running until the end of October, where thousands of seasonal workers would travel to France, working in vineyards to harvest grapes by hand. Stephen had arranged via an agency to work at a winery by the name of Earl de la Roche in the auvergne rhone alpes region, and he planned to travel further north after picking season was over. 
he was setting off again at five o'clock in the morning uh, to get to um, the port to get him over across the channel to, to France. And his idea was once he got to France, he was going to hitch his way to the vineyard. I'd packed up sandwiches and, uh, for him to have on the journey over to uh, across the channel. And I made him a swag bag, you know, like a, a tramp in those days would have a, a knotted handkerchief on the end of a stick. Well, obviously he didn't take all that. He just took the, the sandwiches and his suitcase. He gave me his car. So he thought, I'm going away. So perhaps you can look after my car for me while I'm gone. And it was a very beaten up old um, Ford Anglia. And I know that when it was really, really on its last legs, I took it to the local scrapyard and I got two pounds for it. But I've still got the two pounds. If he ever comes back, he can have it. Stephen left at five o'clock in the morning on October the 1st. We wished him a good time and hoped he fitted in well and everything would be right. And the very last words he said were, I'll see you at Christmas, if not before. As the days and weeks passed, the family started to question why they hadn't heard from Stephen, who was always so diligent about writing home. He never wrote to communicate that he had arrived. I did begin to wonder, but then I thought, well, I expect they're busy all day picking the grapes and probably having a bit of a social life at night. So I wasn't over-worried. And then, six weeks later, on the 20th, of November, um, Stuart had the accident. Stuart had stayed on a past his usual time at school for a pantomime rehearsal. And so when he got to this busy main road, there was usually a person there holding up a board to stop the traffic for the school children. But he was long gone. As Stuart approached where he would usually cross, there was one lady walking behind him and she said she saw him walk to the curb, looking right and left. And then by then she'd passed him. And the next thing she heard was the screech of brakes. And she saw that he'd been in collision with a motorbike. He was obviously hit by the cyclist and, and fell to the ground and hit his head. Stuart, who was only 10 years old at the time, was taken to West Middlesex Hospital in Isleworth. He had not a single mark on him to show that he'd been involved in a, a traffic accident. I went to put my hand on his forehead and he said, don't touch me, it's too painful. And then he started calling me Mrs. Brown, which was one of his teachers at school. Later that night, Stuart's condition dramatically deteriorated, causing him to slip into a coma. Vera decided that she had to try and reach Stephen and let him know what had happened. I did get in touch with the BBC and have a message sent out to Stephen. We knew he would no longer be um, great picking at that particular venue because it would only last for about three weeks of great picking. So he would have moved on. And we had um, a bulletin sent out on the World Service informing Stephen that his younger brother had had a serious accident. But of course, you don't know whether Stephen or anyone that knew him or was with him ever heard that message. She also managed to get in touch with the agency Stephen had booked his trip through. But as he'd already moved on from the vineyard, they were unable to offer much help. The next few weeks were an extraordinarily trying time for Vera, Richard and the rest of the family. Their grief for their youngest son, comatose, with what were expected to be life-altering injuries, were compounded when Christmas came and went with no sign of Stephen. 
It was a weird one, of course, because we were hoping Steve would turn up and then we were also concentrating on Stuart at the same time. So it was very difficult for mum and dad. Probably all bought him Christmas presents, uh, expecting him to return. Three months after his accident, in February 1976, Stuart woke up. He was totally blind, brain damaged, and the brain damage was like someone with Alzheimer's. Stuart remembered everything in detail, including how bright he was at all his lessons at school, but he wouldn't even know if he'd had breakfast that day. The accident had also left Stuart permanently disabled, requiring a wheelchair. His parents worked extremely hard with him on his rehabilitation, and Vera left her job to be there for her son. He gradually got his uh, speech back and then my husband was determined to get back this beautiful, bright boy. So my husband and Stuart would spend their whole day learning Braille and um, Stuart became an excellent Braille reader. Having a child endure such a traumatic accident would be enough to overwhelm the toughest parents. But Vera and Richard also had to contend with the fact that they had not seen or heard from their eldest son in months. They were deeply concerned. Vera took it upon herself to write to Maurice and Noel Chatelain, the proprietors of the winery where Stephen had worked, whose name she had gotten off the travel agency. I didn't speak French, only a few phrases. A family friend translated my letters into the French language and I sent them off and I did get a reply um, in French so I had that translated back. And they just told me general things about Stephen and the date that he left. They didn't give me a great deal of information. The family contacted Stephen's friends from university to check if anyone had heard from him, but none had, and attempts to involve the UK authorities in their son's disappearance proved to be fruitless. We tried to enlist the help of the English police, and they just said, oh, he was over 21, he's considered an adult, it's up to him what he does with his life. And that was the genuine reaction we got from the English police. Undeterred, they sought out other groups who might be able to help with the search for Stephen. We started with the Salvation Army because we knew of their reputation of um, helping to trace missing people. We also went to the British Red Cross and uh, the only help they said they could give us was if there were any unidentified bodies taken to mortuaries in France or, and to see if any of, any, any of the details matched up with Stephen's details. At this point, Vera started to ask herself questions about her son's mindset. Was there a possibility he had deliberately gone missing? I'm not sure that in his own heart he felt he had worked hard enough at university. I can't remember what degree he got, which is, but I know it wasn't a top degree and I know that he was disappointed. So, you know, that obviously was one of the influences on him not being able to make up his mind immediately. Six years went by without any new developments. The family had tried various methods of making contact over the years. I did publish, uh, just paid to have published Happy Birthday to him in a couple of newspapers. I knew he read the Daily Mirror that his father read and he also read The Guardian and I had birthday messages. I only one year put in both of those, no response. They decided that they needed to take more direct action. Confident for the first time that they would be able to leave Stuart in someone else's care, in 1981, Vera and Richard travelled to France to try and find their son themselves. In Besançon, 
about two hours from the winery where Stephen had worked, Vera and Richard made contact with the local police. They did have someone in the police premises that could speak a little bit of English. And so we're able to get around, get to the point of why we wanted their help. But they said if we would return the following day, they would get an interpreter. The Gibbs did just that. And when they met with the interpreter, an unexpected theory about what may have happened to Stephen was floated. They thought we would be interested in the fact that that very day when we went to the police station in France, they had seized the records of this Mooney sect. Moonies was the name given to members of the Family Federation for World Peace and Unification, otherwise known as the Unification Church. The group was established in Korea in the 1950s by Sun Myung Moon, a man claiming to be the Messiah, and was frequently accused of being a cult by its critics. Their chief aim was to restore the kingdom of heaven on earth. They had no foundation. They just set up these sects. And what they did, they recruited people literally off the streets. If you join the Moonies, you're you're sworn to not make contact with your family, basically. So you become a a slave, if you like, to the the chief Mooney. They t- then took all their worldly wealth that they might possess at the time, that would be jewellery, clothes, money, recorded it in their register and gave the person a new name and flowing robes that they all wore. So it had been seized by the police and they combed through this re- these records because it would have had Stephen's real name and beside that, his name that he'd been given. They might have changed his name to Moonbeam or something like that. But there was no trace of Stephen. Vera and Richard travelled onto the vineyard to meet Stephen's former employers and see if they could offer up any clues as to where he might have gone next. They didn't know we were coming. And so I have to applaud them also for giving us a very warm welcome. And when we conveyed who we were, oh, they poured us out a glass of white lead, I remember, and and sat down to talk to us. They brought out their records of 1975 when Stephen was there. They seemed very good record keepers, the French. They kept a separate record for each year and it didn't take them long to find it. And they were able to give us some further information. They'd never had any contact from Stephen since that once he worked at the vineyard. They'd never had contact from any of the other people that worked with Stephen at the vineyard. Maurice and Noel provided Vera and Richard with the names and addresses of about half a dozen other people, some French, some English, who had worked at the vineyard at the same time as Stephen. And they were also able to tell us that he made friends with an Austrian girl who arrived at the vineyard already obviously pregnant. And Stephen seemed to take on a caring role And he also got friendly with a group of Austrians. And the vineyard owners remembered dropping all the Austrian group off at Leon Station. And their intention was to work north with the harvests. I did write to the British Embassy in Austria in case he had decided to settle down with this Austrian girl and perhaps taken out Austrian citizenship. But I didn't get any helpful information back from them. Armed with several new leads, Vera and Richard returned to London 
and began to chase up Stephen's fellow pickers. We had only one positive answer uh, from a lady that uh, was the mother of a girl that was there. And the girl remembered Stephen, but she didn't. She didn't know anything about him or where he might have moved on to. It was a deflating result for the Gibbs after such effort on their part. However, they remained steadfast in their belief that something untoward had happened to Stephen and that he hadn't just left to make a new life abroad with no intention of ever returning. They had several pieces of evidence which they felt backed up that belief. One thing I do remember, and I think this is quite relevant, is that Steve never applied for a a French driving licence. And as far as we know, he's never applied for a um, French citizenship either. Stephen's bank account also remained untouched throughout this time. I know Stephen had £6 in his bank account when he went to France. And I know that six pounds was still there all those years later. He had very little money. That's why he was going to hitchhike all the way to the the vineyard when he got to France. While Stephen had taken his passport with him, they discovered, through the Salvation Army, that it hadn't been renewed. There was also the issue of the car. If he had intended to go away, why wouldn't he have driven it? to Dover or wherever he was he he departed and just abandon it because it would have saved him the train fare of getting to Dover. The family weighed up what the most likely scenarios were. One is he's had an accident and lost his memory. Two is he just doesn't want to come home and doesn't want to know the family for whatever reason. Another reason could be that he might have died, of course, But as long as there was no body, they couldn't let go of the idea that Stephen might still be out there. Life moved on, because it had to. Roger joined the fire brigade. Both he and Tracy married and had families of their own. Stuart eventually moved into Seeability, an assisted living facility. He came home on weekends and went on holiday with his mum every year. Vera and Richard separated in 1988. Looking back, that had a lot to do with the pressures of having a disabled child because you don't have, as you're getting older, you have time to spend together doing things that you want to do. But we never got to that stage in our lives. And so it was always getting carers in to manage the hours when Either of us were not at home and the pressures of everything just became too much. Vera and Richard were determined the family remain close and they continued to spend every Christmas together until Richard's death from cancer in 2002. Sadly, both Stuart and Tracy have also since passed away. With the advent of social media in the noughties, Roger felt he had a fresh set of tools to try and track his brother down. So you tap in Stephen Gibbs on Facebook and about a thousand or more Stephen Gibbses come up. So I thought, well, okay, well, I'll join this this expats in France group and see if anyone might know him even. You know, there's thousands of them on there, so you never know if one of them might know our Stephen. I wrote a note about my, my brother sent the photographs just to say, does anyone on this group know my brother? And most of them said, well, of course, no, we don't know him. But one came up with this idea. She'd used this company, this uh, private detective, to find a relative of hers. And so she gave me the address and the website. And at that point, of course, I communicated with them. And as I say, after maybe six months of them searching, they came back with the same result of, of we can't find Steve and we've got no, no sign of where he might be. It was another disappointing result for a family who felt they had done everything they could to try and find their missing loved one. Vera is now 86 and still hopeful that one day she and Stephen will be reunited. I stopped driving about 
five or six years ago until I stopped driving. If I saw anyone in the high street with long blonde hair, I would want to look in the rear view mirror as I passed them to see if it was my son. Roger continues to make inquiries online and has one lead he's keen to follow up on. One of the people on this group, uh, expats in France, said that there was a Stephen Richard Gibbs who was the president of the, I hope I pronounce this correctly, Swiak Golf and Country Club. And so I thought, well, okay, that's a possibility. So I looked on Facebook to find this golf club and I looked through every single photograph on their group and I found a photograph of a chap that I thought looked like Steve might look now. So what it, what he looked like was he looked a bit like my dad. So I communicated with the manager of the golf club who assured me that this bloke in the photograph was French and so therefore he wasn't my brother. And I was also given a, a, a birth date that wasn't the same as Steve's. I had planned actually to go to France, but of course with all the restrictions, we're not allowed to. So I might still go to France next summer or this summer go to the golf club and see if he's hanging about. It's just a, a theory. So, But it would be nice to do it, but I, I, well, who knows? Both Vera and Roger want nothing more than to be reunited with Stephen, if he's still out there. We just absolutely would be over the moon if he was to show up. And, and I guess what I would say to him, and I, I, I'm sure Mum would absolutely agree with this, that there's no bad feeling about the fact that we haven't seen him for 46 years. You know, we just would be so ecstatic and elated to see him. If anyone had any information of Steve to divulge the information as soon as possible, if I could at least know he was alive and that he was well, and that I would hope he would like to see like to get together with us again because I know that when there are absences the longer the absence goes on the harder it is for them to make contact but if he knew that we would just be so overwhelmed to see him again and to know that he's had I hope a happy life In many cases, it takes just one piece of information to lead police or family to the answers they crave. If you know what happened to Stephen, or you remember seeing someone like him in France, your information could be vital. Even if you've never heard of Stephen Gibbs before listening to this episode, you could still help. Visit our website, themissingpodcast.org, where you'll find more information on this and every other case we featured in the series. On our site, you can join the conversation and help with the investigation. There's a dedicated forum, moderated carefully by Locate, where you can get updates on the case, share your theories, and discuss the facts with real investigators from Locate International. The series is also made with the help of missing people, who work tirelessly to support the families of the missing. Their helpline is open to offer support and advice if you've been affected by anything in this episode. You can reach them by calling or texting 116 000 or by emailing them at 116 000 at missingpeople.org.uk. We can't say this enough. It takes just one person with the right information to solve any of the cases in this series. Stephen's family hope that the information will soon arrive to solve this one. The Missing is an Amazon exclusive podcast series. You can listen to every episode of season four right now exclusively on Amazon Music. The series is produced by What's The Story Sounds. The producer is Jack O'Kennedy. Executive producers for What's The Story Sounds are Sophie Ellis and Daryl Brown, and the producer for Amazon is Megan Bradshaw. <laughs>